Father, what is my purpose? I am not your father, and here is your pickaxe. I yearn for the mines! Ladies, gentlemen, and pals of all ages, last week we talked about base building, automation, and some good base worker pals for relatively early game, and since then there have been calls and requests non-stop for an updated one for the mid to late game section of the game, and wait no longer, it is now time! When it comes to the mid to late game materials, there are a lot more things to actually worry about than just wood and stone, and some you will need in equally large amounts if you want to truly build out your dream empire and make getting all of the mid to late game actual crafting sorted out so that you have a much easier transition into the actual end game as well, with much less hassle than you otherwise would. As a result of that, today we're going to be talking about generally important later game base building practices, concepts to keep in mind when putting things together for your main setup, things like that, and we'll also cover a base that will sort out all of your both ore and coal base needs in one singular place so you can easily craft loads of refined ingots, and how to somewhat automate the process of gathering materials for cement as well, which is an extremely important mid to late game material as it is a component of the highest two rarities of PAL spheres. Then we'll round it all off, of course, with a nice list of relatively easily acquirable, extremely high quality PALs for base work and automation specifically that you have access to before you even reach max level. Starting off then, let's talk about good later game base building practices for your main setup, your home, so to say. First things first, ditch the wood. I have seen way too many horror stories of a single unexpected raid where a fire element attack went off and destroyed everything in seconds. So the second that you can start building with stone instead of wood, it should probably be your top priority. You can also unlock metal later on, and it is technically more resistant to damage, but it is also aesthetically very um, industrial, let's say, so there are of course aesthetic reasons to use it, and that choice is totally up to you. I just highly recommend not using wood, because, well, this will happen. And trust me, you do not want this to happen. So definitely move on from wood as soon as you physically can, or else that will spread through your entire base, taking the whole things down to shreds the moment that there's a raid that happens that has any sort of fire element damage. On the note of raids though, something we didn't cover last time is walls. You want to build defensive walls around your base as soon as you realistically can, as there is a random chance of a raid happening at any given point, attacking one of your bases, trying to sort of catch you by surprise and take it all down. Walls make this much stronger, as it simply gives you a layer of defense the raiders have to break through before getting to the stuff that you actually care about. However, while you might think it would be logical to also make a gate, this commenter on the last video also had an interesting piece of advice. Their recommendation was to build a gate, sure, but leave the door open to it instead of closed. I think we can take this to an even further level though, which is don't put in a gate at all. Leave one just purely open section in your wall that is tiny and acts sort of like a funnel. You can make it even smaller than you would with a gate by doing something like this. This means that the actual opening is incredibly small, so if a raid actually happens, they will all just sort of funnel through here. You also want to install an alarm bell so you can actually set all of your pals to attack mode if and when a raid happens, and the enemies will all just barrel into your tiny gap in the wall, letting your pals make short work of them really quick, then just get back to work, no problem. The lack of a gate also seems to deter the game from spawning flying enemy raids, which makes them much easier to deal with as well, and it's worth mentioning on the topic that stone defensive walls only have 5,000 health compared to wood walls having 20,000 and metal having 50,000, so you may want to make some aesthetic compromises there if you want to, especially as again, the wood is instantly destroyed by fire long term. However, with our strategy of having an open funnel, the walls shouldn't actually be the focus of an attack at any point, as there's an easy way to actually get in for enemies without actually breaking through the walls. Past that, a lot of stuff is just sort of sensible progression of the same principles that we talked about last time, with some exceptions. First, you want to upgrade your food farm to incorporate lettuce plantations once you have that unlocked. They take more planting and water power to actually grow, but they are more valuable overall as well. That said, don't get rid of the berries entirely, as they are an ingredient for cake and breeding. On which note, we won't be talking about a breeding farm setup today, as we already have that in this video here, so hop on over to that if that's what you're looking for. Last time we talked about the concept of automating wood and stone in your base. That still, of course, applies at higher levels. They are still very important materials, and you can make them even better with their other category build item, such as the stump and axe, which increases lumber production within the base, and there's one of these for pretty much every different base work skill as well. Having multiple of each does nothing, sure, but having one of them increases the production levels of their individual skill, and it tells you what it does when you actually look at it, and they're pretty much all useful for their own reasons, and honestly, they're an imperative inclusion to your main production base, especially once you get to the part of the game where they're unlocked. On a similar note, another thing that you'll want to work out later in the game sections is electricity, as a lot of high-end base equipment 
such as the assembly and production lines, or the lighting for the base at night, or even the Super Endgame Furnace and Medicine Bench require electricity to function. To get electricity, simply place down one of these pylons in your base and assign a pal with electricity-based skill on it. A personal favorite of mine for this is Relaxaurus Lux. Relatively easy to create, as you can breed it from a combo of Relaxaurus and Sparkit, the little low-level electric rodent, and the result is providing electricity, a level 3 electricity generator on Relaxaurus Lux with no other base skills too, and so his whole purpose is just giving you electricity at a high level. Aside from that, you ideally want to upgrade your pal beds a bit here too. Fluffy pal beds are just sort of better than the regular pal beds are, and you can also make large pal beds later in the game for your bigger pals that you have in the base too. All this matters for increasing the comfort of your pals, but I believe it also just increases the sanity regeneration they get while sleeping, so it's just it's a good thing to have in general. As well, you want to upgrade your hot tub to a high quality hot tub as soon as you can, as that increases the sanity regeneration speed, thus increasing the productivity as well. And at this point, I feel like uh, I'm sort of delivering a PowerPoint in a boardroom, pulling at my necktie because I'm getting a little sweaty, but you get the idea. Higher quality versions of the things that you were already using simply make them better. The items located in the other category almost all contribute to boosting production for their related activity as well. Outside of that then, let's just go over the same practices from before that you want for your food farm. And as we mentioned, wanting a mix of berries and lettuce at the stage, you also want a wheat plantation or two, but those can be at your breeding base if you want. Then you also want a food box where the food can be automatically stored and then eaten by your pals so you don't have to take care of that at all manually. You can also make a refrigerator if you are producing food faster than you are consuming it so that you can save things a bit longer before they go bad and disappear. As well, cooking makes food more effective as well, but it is generally unnecessary at this stage at least because the speed of production on basic food is more than enough to sustain long term on the medium level pals that you'll be having around now. On top of that, there is the silo to increase the planting efficiency and the water fountain to increase the watering efficiency too. You want electricity, which we talked about earlier, then you want your stone pit and your little patch of lumber as well, both of which making your infinite wood and stone farm. Axe and stump to boost the lumber efficiency, mining cart to boost the mining efficiency. You also want storage boxes just all around the place. This base I threw up relatively quickly with the most efficient setup that I could as a sort of template for you all to work around. But the ideal storage crates are not these giant shipping crates, they're these nice refined metal cabinets that you see over here. They have exactly the same amount of space in them as the giant storage cases, but take up exceedingly less actual space and look a lot better, unless I guess you're going for that industrial factory aesthetic for, again, lack of a bit of a better term. Past that, you of course want your crusher, which is powered by watering pals to either turn wood into fiber or stone into pallium. And that second one is the thing that you really want a lot of, especially as you get later in the game. So essentially we use our infinite source of stone to create an infinite source of pallium, just a somewhat slow one. Past that, I would say for your actual production and assembly line setup, you want to make sure there's a bit of space in between them. You can pretty much stack them on top of each other end to end, but if you put them too close side by side, there won't be enough room for your handiwork pals to actually get in there and make the things. And of course, on that note, you also want the toolbox for production efficiency. With all that covered, then let's move on to our main expansion base of the day. And generally, I recommend the setup that you have being your main home base, full of production type things, a breeding base as your second base, and a solid mining base as a third base to have. The mining base we recommended last week was focused around purely ore, as you need a ton of it and early on, you just want pure ore over a mixed mining base, because other rocks to mine means that they're going to be mining the ore less frequently. But as you reach further in, a material that becomes pretty much equally as important is coal, which also comes from mining but a different kind of rocks, and is required for refined metal ingots, the next tier up of metal crafting material. And so this right here is the specific location that we're going to pack up and move our mining setup at this stage of the game, and it is genuinely perfect. A massive amount of ore nodes and also coal nodes so that you can farm both of them in pretty large quantities in the same location. Also, it's on the top of a cliff with no access points, which makes it nearly fully just raid proof by default. No need to even set up any walls because nothing can even get here. As for setting it up to function as an automated mining base, you need food for which berries are still more than good enough. So a few berry plantations, a feed box to store it. You want beds, of course, for all of your pals as well. Same standards that I mentioned for the beds earlier and a nice high quality hot tub or two to actually de-stress your workers. Then, as ugly as it looks, the most efficient way to do this is just sort of put storage box between the actual ore and cold nodes. You don't want to get too close because if you overlap where the actual things that spawn, then it will block the respawn of the ore nodes, but just spaced out between every couple of rocks so that your transport piles have the minimum amount of distance to cover required. Then you of course want the part of the process that actually turns the ore and coal into more important goods, and at this stage you can use an improved furnace to directly turn the ore and coal into refined metal ingots as so, fully automated into this location. 
The only actual personal input that you need to do here is setting the ingots to craft once in a while. It's also worth mentioning that you can have multiple different kindling pals, and while only one of them can really work on this at a time, if you make multiple of the improved furnaces, you can make it split into multiple stacks and thus make the whole thing consolidate much faster. Past that point, you just want the pals to actually fill out your work roles. So let's go over a nice healthy collection of pals that fit this base perfectly. First things first, let's take care of our food itself, and I highly recommend Brawn Cherry for this. Level 3 seating, no other base work functions, so they will never get distracted. These are the areas that it spawns, you can get it pretty early in the level 20s, maybe even a little bit before if you find the right place. Then there's also Brawn Cherry Aqua, which is the exact same thing, but for watering specifically. So another very high priority for actually keeping your base going. And you can actually get this in the wild too at a specific boss spawn location, or you can breed it between Brawn Cherry and Fwack. These two together will just produce food together like crazy on their own, a perfect seeder and a perfect waterer. Then you just need a gatherer to actually gather right at the end. As for the actual mining operation itself, now that you have your food covered, we've got Anubis. This pal has level four handiwork, level three mining and level three transporting. The handiwork won't come into play here, so it won't be a distraction, but level three mining is incredible. And the only other base skill it has is transporting level two, which is of course also necessary to move the coal and ore into the boxes so we can smelt it anyways. It's worth noting an absolute army of Anubises is actually awesome to have once you can start breeding them. And the ideal passive skill to look for, singularly speaking, is Artisan for a 50% work speed boost. But you can also combo that with Work Slave for a further boost. Then of course, even things like Swift are a big deal as movement speed does increase productivity, especially with the transporting part of the process. It's also worth mentioning that for Anubis itself, the way that you can get it easily earlier in the game is by breeding together a few different types of creatures. And one of the combinations you can get relatively early is Chillet, which spawns at a boss over here, combined with Quiver, which spawns as a boss over here. At that point, once you've got all this set up, then you will have mass amounts of ore and coal flooding into the inventory of the base, going into the storage boxes. So let's talk about the pal that you want to use to harness this and turn it into the refined metal ingots itself, with the ideal one at this stage, in my opinion, being Ragnahawk, who is both level three kindling, making him great at getting your fires going, but also level three transporting. That's great because we won't always be smelting, so he has a purpose outside of that that helps out quite a bit. But also, generally speaking, smelting takes priority over transport, so it isn't even a negative at any point. That does it for your mining base setup then, but we aren't quite done yet. I did promise one more thing, which is a way to farm for cement. There are three ingredients for cement. Stone, which we already have an automated source of. Bone, which cannot be automated in the standard sense at least, but I've got a nice trick for. And then pal fluid, which actually cannot be automated at all, as sad as that is, but we've got a nice tip for making that a little bit better as well. As for the bones then, they come from a number of different pals on kill or capture, but you can technically get an automated infinite farm for them. It's just really slow and morally quite questionable, honestly. The strat then is relatively simple. Around the world, there are these wandering merchant NPCs. Some of them literally wandering, but most of them in set locations. The wandering merchants wearing red outfits always sell basic crafting materials, and they can sell you bones for 100 gold apiece. Gold isn't the most plentiful early on, sure, but you can get it pretty reliably as it drops in large quantities from higher level dungeons. But just for the sake of it, you can actually technically automate gold gain, as deploying Vixie to your base to graze at the ranch will provide you with gold, among many other things. Just not in massive amounts, necessarily. Combine that with the fact that you can, um, well, let's just say, uh, capture one of the wandering merchants so that you can deploy him at your base and then actively buy things from him there. So technically you can bring that to your base and give yourself a basically automated bone farm. In the end of the day, we got a bunch of gold, you got a bunch of bones, simple as that. And this is just the best way to automate it, which isn't the quickest, but the best way to actually gather gold is actively doing dungeons. As for pal fluid then, there is simply no easy way to farm it and no way to automate it either. Your best bet really is to just run around the coastline of these starter islands, especially the archipelago at the bottom left side where all the low level water pals are. And then you just specifically want to catch them, not kill them. If your pal spheres out level them enough, then you basically just have 100% catch chance, even at full health. And then the trick here is to just get their actual defeat rewards from capturing them. But then you can also double down and use the butcher's knife back in your base to kill the captured pal permanently, but get a second load of loot from the one pal. So yes, this is absolutely grim as all hell. I won't disagree with that. And it makes me question every moral that I thought I had as a person. But if you want to be technically as efficient as possible, this is the tip that I can give you. Capturing a thinking man, lock him in a room to infinitely sell you bones, then go out and collect low level water creatures just for the sake of butchering them in your own home. And this, at this point, I'm starting to be concerned about everything that I'm saying and doing. So I think that covers it for today. Hopefully this helps you out with your mid to late game base preparations, all the adjustments to make from the earlier base building practices we talked about, new things to consider, and of course the new entire concepts of electricity and things like that. It's not too complex at all once you sit down and work it out, but it definitely 
really is easier if you know all the little ins and outs. So I really hope that this has helped you all out in your continuing Power World journey. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. <laughs> Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye